As the chill of winter descends upon Orchard Knob, a shadow of uncertainty hangs over the March family. The decisions made in the previous chapter have begun to ripple outward, impacting not only the individual lives of the sisters, but also the fabric of their tightly knit bond. Jo, fueled by her unwavering ambition, embarks on a daring new venture that tests her courage and challenges her sense of self. Meg, grappling with the consequences of her recent choice, finds herself navigating a sea of conflicting emotions and societal pressures. Beth, shrouded in a cloak of melancholy, struggles to find solace amidst the changing landscape of her world. And Amy, venturing into uncharted territory, discovers hidden truths that threaten to unravel the carefully constructed world she thought she knew. In this poignant and introspective chapter, we witness the March sisters grappling with the harsh realities of life. They confront their vulnerabilities, face the consequences of their choices, and learn invaluable lessons about love, loss, and the enduring strength of family. Join us as we delve into the depths of their emotions, witness their unwavering support for one another, and discover the resilience that allows them to weather even the most challenging storms. 16. Letters. In the cold gray dawn, the sisters lit their lamp and read their chapter with an earnestness never felt before. For now, the shadow of a real trouble had come. The little books were full of help and comfort. And, as they dressed, they agreed to say goodbye cheerfully and hopefully and send their mother on her anxious journey unsaddened by tears or complaints from them. Everything seemed very strange when they went down, so dim and still outside, so full of light and bustle within. Breakfast at that early hour seemed odd, and even Hannah's familiar face looked unnatural as she flew about her kitchen with her nightcap on. The big trunk stood ready in the hall, mother's cloak and bonnet lay on the sofa, and mother herself sat trying to eat, but looking so pale and worn with sleeplessness and anxiety that the girls found it very hard to keep their resolution. Meg's eyes kept filling in spite of herself. Jo was obliged to hide her face in the kitchen roller more than once, and the little girls wore a grave, troubled expression, as if sorrow was a new experience to them. Nobody talked much, but as the time drew very near and they sat waiting for the carriage, Mrs. March said to the girls, who were all busied about her, one folding her shawl, another smoothing out the strings of her bonnet, a third putting on her overshoes, and a fourth fastening up her traveling bag. Children, I leave you to Hannah's care and Mr. Lawrence's protection. Hannah is faithfulness itself, and our good neighbor will guard you as if you were his own. I have no fears for you, yet I am anxious that you should take this trouble rightly. Don't grieve and fret when I am gone, or think that you can comfort yourselves by being idle and trying to forget. Go on with your work as usual, for work is a blessed solace. Hope and keep busy, and whatever happens, remember that you never can be fatherless. Yes, mother. Meg, dear, be prudent. Watch over your sisters, consult Hannah, and in any perplexity, go to Mr. Lawrence. Be patient, Joe. Don't get despondent or do rash things. Write to me often, and be my brave girl, ready to help and cheer us all. Beth, comfort yourself with your music, and be faithful to the little home duties. And you, Amy, help all you can, be obedient, and keep happy safe at home. We will, mother, we will! The rattle of an approaching carriage made them all start and listen. That was the hard minute, but the girls stood it well. No one cried, no one ran away or uttered a lamentation, though their hearts were very heavy as they sent loving messages to Father, remembering, as they spoke, that it might be too late to deliver them. They kissed their mother quietly, clung about her tenderly, and tried to wave their hands cheerfully when she drove away. Lori and his grandfather came over to see her off, and Mr. Brooke looked so strong and sensible and kind that the girls christened him Mr. Greatheart on the spot. Goodbye, my darlings. God bless and keep us all, whispered Mrs. March, as she kissed one dear little face after the other and hurried into the carriage. As she rolled away, the sun came out, and looking back, she saw it shining on the group at the gate, like a good omen. They saw it also, and smiled and waved their hands, and the last thing she beheld as she turned the corner was the four bright faces, and behind them, like a bodyguard, old Mr. Lawrence, faithful Hannah, and devoted Lori. How kind everyone is to us, she said, 
turning to find fresh proof of it in the respectful sympathy of the young man's face. "'I don't see how they can help it,' returned Mr. Brooke, laughing so infectiously that Mrs. March could not help smiling. And so the long journey began with the good omens of sunshine, smiles, and cheerful words. "'I feel as if there had been an earthquake,' said Joe, as their neighbors went home to breakfast, leaving them to rest and refresh themselves. "'It seems as if half the house was gone,' added Meg forlornly. Beth opened her lips to say something, but could only point to the pile of nicely mended hose which lay on Mother's table, showing that even in her last hurried moments she had thought and worked for them. It was a little thing, but it went straight to their hearts, and, in spite of their brave resolutions, they all broke down and cried bitterly. Hannah wisely allowed them to relieve their feelings, and, when the shower showed signs of clearing up, she came to the rescue, armed with a coffee pot. Now, my dear young ladies, remember what your ma said, and don't fret. Come and have a cup of coffee all round, and then let's fall to work and be a credit to the family. Coffee was a treat, and Hannah showed great tact in making it that morning. No one could resist her persuasive nods, or the fragrant invitation issuing from the nose of the coffee pot. They drew up to the table, exchanged their handkerchiefs for napkins, and in ten minutes were all right again. Hope and keep busy. That's the motto for us, so let's see who will remember it best. I shall go to Aunt March, as usual. Oh, won't she lecture, though, said Joe, as she sipped with returning spirit. I shall go to my king's, though I'd much rather stay at home and attend to things here, said Meg, wishing she hadn't made her eyes so red. No need of that. Beth and I can keep house perfectly well, put in Amy with an important air. Hannah will tell us what to do, and we'll have everything nice when you come home, added Beth, getting out her mop and dish tub without delay. I think anxiety is very interesting, observed Amy, eating sugar pensively. The girls couldn't help laughing and felt better for it, though Meg shook her head at the young lady who could find consolation in a sugar bowl. The sight of the turnovers made Joe sober again, and when the two went out to their daily tasks, they looked sorrowfully back at the window where they were accustomed to see their mother's face. It was gone, but Beth had remembered the little household ceremony, and there she was, nodding away at them like a rosy-faced mandarin. "'That's so like my Beth,' said Joe, waving her hat with a grateful face. "'Goodbye, Maggie. I hope the kings won't train today. Don't fret about father, dear,' she added as they parted. "'And I hope Aunt March won't croak. Your hair is becoming, and it looks very boyish and nice.' returned Meg, trying not to smile at the curly head, which looked comically small on her tall sister's shoulders. That's my only comfort. And touching her hat a la Lori, away went Joe, feeling like a shorn sheep on a wintry day. News from their father comforted the girls very much, for, though dangerously ill, the presence of the best and tenderest of nurses had already done him good. Mr. Brooke sent a bulletin every day, and, as the head of the family, Meg insisted on reading the dispatches, which grew more and more cheering as the week passed. At first, everyone was eager to write, and plump envelopes were carefully poked into the letterbox by one or other of the sisters, who felt rather important with their Washington correspondence. As one of these packets contained characteristic notes from the party, we will rob an imaginary mail and read them. My dearest mother, It is impossible to tell you how happy your last letter made us, for the news was so good we couldn't help laughing and crying over it. How very kind Mr. Brooke is, and how fortunate that Mr. Lawrence's business detains him near you so long, since he is so useful to you and father. The girls are all as good as gold. Joe helps me with the sewing and insists on doing all sorts of hard jobs. I should be afraid she might overdo if I didn't know that her moral fit wouldn't last long. Beth is as regular about her tasks as a clock, and never forgets what you told her. She grieves about father and looks sober, except when she is at her little piano. Amy minds me nicely, and I take great care of her. She does her own hair, and I am teaching her to make buttonholes and mend her stockings. She tries very hard, and I know you will be pleased with her improvement when you come. Mr. Lawrence watches over us like a motherly old hen, as Joe says, and Lori is very kind and neighborly. He and Joe keep us merry, for we get pretty blue sometimes and feel like orphans with you so far away. Hannah is a perfect saint. She does not scold at all and always calls me Miss Margaret, which is quite proper, you know, and treats me with respect. 
We are all well and busy, but we long day and night to have you back. Give my dearest love to Father, and believe me, ever your own, Meg. This note, prettily written on scented paper, was a great contrast to the next, which was scribbled on a big sheet of thin foreign paper, ornamented with blots and all manner of flourishes and curly-tailed letters. My precious Marmy, Three cheers for dear father. Brooke was a trump to telegraph right off and let us know the minute he was better. I rushed up Garrett when the letter came and tried to thank God for being so good to us, but I could only cry and say, I'm glad, I'm glad. Didn't that do as well as a regular prayer? For I felt a great many in my heart. We have such funny times, and now I can enjoy them, for everyone is so desperately good, it's like living in a nest of turtle doves. You'd laugh to see Meg head the table and try to be motherish. She gets prettier every day, and I'm in love with her sometimes. The children are regular archangels, and I, well, I'm Joe, and never shall be anything else. Oh, I must tell you that I came near having a quarrel with Lori. I freed my mind about a silly little thing, and he was offended. I was right, but didn't speak as I ought, and he marched home, saying he wouldn't come again till I begged pardon. I declared I wouldn't and got mad. It lasted all day. I felt bad and wanted you very much. Lori and I are both so proud. It's hard to beg pardon. But I thought he'd come to it, for I was in the right. He didn't come, and just at night I remembered what you said when Amy fell into the river. I read my little book, felt better, resolved not to let the sun set on my anger, and ran over to tell Lori I was sorry. I met him at the gate, coming for the same thing. We both laughed, begged each other's pardon, and felt all good and comfortable again. I made a poem yesterday when I was helping Hannah wash, and, as Father likes my silly little things, I put it in to amuse him. Give him the lovingest hug that ever was, and kiss yourself a dozen times for your topsy-turvy Joe. A Song from the Suds Queen of my tub, I merrily sing, while the white foam rises high, and sturdily wash and rinse and wring, and fasten the clothes to dry. Then out in the free, fresh air they swing under the sunny sky. I wish we could wash from our hearts and souls the stains of the week away, and let water and air by their magic make ourselves as pure as they. Then, on the earth, there would be indeed a glorious washing day. Along the path of a useful life will heart's ease ever bloom. The busy mind has no time to think of sorrow or care or gloom and anxious thoughts may be swept away as we bravely wield a broom. I am glad a task to me is given, to labor at day by day, for it brings me health and strength and hope, and I cheerfully learn to say, Head, you may think heart, you may feel, but hand, you shall work alway. Dear Mother, there is only room for me to send my love and some pressed pansies from the root I have been keeping safe in the house for Father to see. I read every morning, try to be good all day, and sing myself to sleep with Father's tune. I can't sing Land of the Leal now. It makes me cry. Everyone is very kind, and we are as happy as we can be without you. Amy wants the rest of the page, so I must stop. I didn't forget to cover the holders, and I wind the clock and air the rooms every day. Kiss dear Father on the cheek he calls mine. Oh, do come soon to your loving little Beth. Ma chère Mama, we are all well, I do my lessons always and never corroborate the girls. Meg says I mean contradict, so I put in both words and you can take the properest. Meg is a great comfort to me and lets me have jelly every night at tea. It's so good for me, Joe says, because it keeps me sweet-tempered. Lori is not as respectful as he ought to be. Now, I am almost in my teens. He calls me chick and hurts my feelings by talking French to me very fast when I say merci or bonjour as Hattie King does. The sleeves of my blue dress were all worn out, and Meg put in new ones, but the full front came wrong, and they are more blue than the dress. I felt bad, but did not fret I bear my troubles well, but I do wish Hannah would put more starch in my aprons and have buckwheats every day. Can't she? Didn't I make that interrogation point nice? Meg says my punctuation and spelling are disgraceful, and I am mortified, but dear me, I have so many things to do, I can't stop. Adieu. I send heaps of love to Papa, your affectionate daughter, Amy Curtis March. Dear Miss March, I just drop a line to say we get on fust rate. 
The girls is clever and fly round right smart. Miss Meg is going to make a proper good housekeeper. She has the liking for it and gets the hang of things surprising quick. Joe do's beat all for going ahead, but she don't stop to calculate fust, and you never know where she's like to bring up. She done out a tub of clothes on Monday, but she starched them afore they was wrenched and blewed a pink calico dress till I thought I should a died a laughin. Beth is the best of little creeters and a sight of help to me, being so forehanded and dependable. She tries to learn everything and really goes to market beyond her years. Likewise, keeps accounts, with my help, quite wonderful. We have got on very economical so fur. I don't let the girls have coffee only once a week, according to your wish, and keep them on plain, wholesome vittles. Amy does well about frettin', wearin' her best clothes, and eatin' sweet stuff. Mr. Lorry is as full of didos as usual, and turns the house upside down frequent, but he heartens up the girls, and so I let him have full swing. The old gentleman sends heaps of things, and is rather wearin', but means wall, and it ain't my place to say nothin'. My bread is riz, so no more at this time. I send my duty to Mr. March, and hope he's seen the last of his pneumonia. Yours respectful, Hannah Mullet. Head nurse of ward, no. Two. All serene on the Rappahannock, troops in fine condition, commissary department well conducted, the home guard under Colonel Teddy always on duty, Commander-in-Chief General Lawrence reviews the army daily, Quartermaster Mullet keeps order in camp, and Major Lyon does picket duty at night. A salute of 24 guns was fired on receipt of good news from Washington, and a dress parade took place at headquarters. Commander-in-Chief sends best wishes, in which he is heartily joined by Colonel Teddy. Dear Madam, The little girls are all well. Beth and my boy report daily. Hannah is a model servant, and guards pretty Meg like a dragon. Glad the fine weather holds. Pray make Brooke useful, and draw on me for funds if expenses exceed your estimate. Don't let your husband want anything. Thank God he is mending. Your sincere friend and servant, James Lawrence. As the final embers of Chapter 16 fade, the March sisters stand on the precipice of a new chapter, their hearts heavy with the weight of revelations and the uncertainty of what lies ahead. Winter's chill seems to penetrate their very souls, mirroring the internal struggles they confront. Jo, her heart ablaze with ambition, must now navigate the treacherous path of pursuing her dreams, venturing beyond the familiar confines of Orchard Knob. Meg, burdened by the consequences of her choices, searches for meaning and acceptance in a world that seems to hold her at bay. Beth, shrouded in an aura of melancholy, seeks solace in the comforting embrace of music, her melody a silent plea for understanding. And Amy, forever a seeker of truth, grapples with the weight of hidden secrets and the shifting sands of her identity. Though the shadows may lengthen and secrets may linger, one thing remains constant, the unbreakable bond of sisterhood. Through laughter and tears, strength and vulnerability, the March sisters stand united, their love for one another a beacon of hope illuminating the path forward. Join us as we embark on this journey with them. Subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications to be the first to witness the next chapter unfold. Together, let us unravel the mysteries that lie ahead and discover the triumphs and tribulations that await the March sisters in the coming winter months. Their story continues, and we invite you to be a part of it.